Welcome to One Thought at a Time with Ian Travers, where we get curious about what makes us tick. We're here today with a man who will never be finished exploring. Welcome, Mel Greaves. Thank you very much. I feel tired, actually, listening to that introduction yeah. now. I've been exploring all morning. That <laughs> <laughs> sounds a bit... So um, to, to, to get us into this uh, today, Mel, I mean, obviously, we've had many, many conversations um, over many, many years. But what would be really good to just start with is uh, just tell us about what do you do now? What do I do now? I, t- I do a number of things, actually. I, I, if you describe it in terms of plates that are spinning, I've got four plates whizzing around at the t- all the time. So that's um, working with, uh, with Thinking It Better with you guys. Uh, which is a fantastic experience, something which I, I, I deeply uh, enjoy. Um, I'm also a consultant with an American firm on uh, on culture shaping, particularly. Um, I have my own coaching company. Um, I apply my trade uh, through that, and I also volunteer for the Princess Trust and and help underprivileged kids get into uh, work in the NHS, in particular. And I'm now very tired thinking about all that. <laughs> It's funny, isn't it? Sometimes, if you think about you know our previous corporate careers, how on earth have we found the time to do this stuff? But yeah, but do you know what? I mean, when when it's something that you really want to do, it doesn't feel like work. I know everybody says that, but it's really true. Yeah, you know, you don't you don't get as tired as you used to do when you were grinding away on the treadmill. Talking about that treadmill, um, let's let's now go back. Uh, just Mel, just if you would describe uh, your professional journey that's got you to where you oh, are. Oh crikey, today. okay. Um, so my professional journey, um, I think it would start with a conversation that I had with a careers advisor back in school who said, um, what do you want to do for if you want to go to university? And I said, well, I want to go there, but um, I don't know what I want to do, but I like physics and I like chemistry. And he said, well, if you add those two together, you kind of get material science. And I said, OK, I'll do that. So, so I did. And I went off to, uh, to Manchester and did material science, loved it, had a great time and uh, and went to to uh, to industry into aerospace. Worked at Rolls Royce as a metallurgist to start with, and I can remember back to those days. This is going back to 1987, 88 sort of time, and I can remember being in the white lab coat, walking up and down the uh, the the, uh, the shop floor, um, working on on aerospace parts, and thinking, "This is it. This is what I want to do. This is fantastic." And seeing people move off into leadership positions and things like that and thinking, why would you want to do that? You know, this is cool. This is great stuff. And if you wind the clock forwards to, you know, a 32-year career, as it was in aerospace, it never panned out like that at all. Of course, there was tons of change. And I ended up getting involved in technical management, operational management roles. Um, I found myself breaking completely away from metallurgy and material science. Um Working in in fields as as, as diverse as um, uh, mergers and acquisitions and trying to sell pieces of the company and things like that, um, forming joint ventures, um, and and ended up working in in uh, in test engineering where I I got to go to some crazy places around the world and experience a whole range of different things, um, doing some very very interesting stuff and building very big projects for very large checks. And and if I look look back over my career, it was never like it was never planned to be like that, you know. And I, I used to do presentations to to young graduates and, and new starters in companies, who would say, um, "So you know, tell us all about your career and how it's all worked out and everything else." And I said, "Well, let me stop you there. Who who's got a career plan?" And, uh, and they'd all kind of hold their hands up and say, "Yeah, yeah, we've got a career plan." And these are like twenty year old kids, you know. And I'd I'd say, "Okay, well, that's great. Um, so if you got it, you got it with you today?" They said, "Yeah." Okay, tear it up. <laughs> and they go, well, what? <laughs> I say, well, tear it up because it's not going to happen like that. What you think is going to happen is not going to. It's not going to be like that. And so just go with it. Just follow where you, where your passions are. And I did the same. And and one of the things that I noticed when I was going through my thirty odd years in, in a variety of different roles was inevitably you end up with a if you like a fund of good days and bad days, you start to notice what what really counts for a good day and what counts for a bad day and what's going on. And and it became increasingly obvious to me that the days that were really, really good, that are memorable, that I enjoyed, were the days that had a lot of stuff about people development and growing people and stuff like that. So when I was working on leadership programs or helping to shape cultures and stuff like that, I found that immensely rewarding and, and very, very motivating. 
and you, and as you get older and older, you start to think, do you know what? Maybe I should just do that all the time. How can I do that? You know, and so hence I've found myself doing what I'm doing today and spinning my four plates. Just going back to the um, the international scene and the experience in travel to different places. Tell us a bit about your enjoyment of different experiences and, and, and cultures. Yeah, it's it, it, inevitably when you when you travel to different places, and particularly when you you're going there not just for a, like a day trip or something, but you spend you spend quite a lot of time there, you know. And I, I spent um, I, I never lived there permanently, but on and off, I was um, I was pretty intensively present in Canada, for example, for about a two to three year period. To the extent where the the border guards were asking me questions about, are you sure you don't work here and not this kind of stuff? So I was able to answer some difficult questions, and the same in places like Malaysia as well, and to some degree Singapore and, and the US. But when you go to these places and you start to absorb yourself into the cultural backdrop, and you start to dispel a lot of kind of myths that you held about about what you thought the country was all about and what it stood for and how it really works, etc. and it, every time I've been somewhere like that for a long period of time and spent a lot of time with the people, you find that there is so much there that you that's good that you never really appreciated, you never thought was there. You know, I've, I've seen kindness and humility in places, in far-flung places where you, you just think, never, I'd never even imagined that, you know, and you see some amazing things. And, and you get to see how people live and why they live in in the ways that that they do you know so working in for example northern canada um in in a remote outpost that was wasn't too far away from the arctic circle you you find yourself living with communities that have to out of necessity go hunting for example now we in the west would go oh that's you know we don't like that that's that's not something that we do you know and um and and so we have a view on it and I carry that view with me into into Canada and talk to the folks in Northern Canada. And then I get completely why they live the lives the way they live, because they have to live the lives that way. And you come away with a completely different perspective. And it teaches you so much, actually, about different people and communities around the world. They're different viewpoints, different faiths, different ways of, of, of eking out a living in some cases, which is really humbling and, and very, very broadening for your own mindset as well. So what, yeah. what do you think? What do you think you've you've really taken away from experiencing those those different cultures? How's that played out in in your professional sort of career? And oh, for me, it's, it's very very simple. I, I I thought that when I was going through my career that I was getting lots and lots of experience, and I pretty much knew how the world worked. And then I very quickly realised that, or eventually realised, I suppose, that I don't know how the world works, and there's a lot that. I can I can still learn, so it, it's given me a real sense of don't make any assumptions about not just people from different cultures, but anybody even from the same culture. You don't know where where, where their their journey has taken them from and to, and and what's going on in their world. Um, so it gives me a real sense of open mindedness, if you like, about how people work and why they work and what their motivations are, and a real sort of spirit of. You know, going back to people like Carl Rogers and and the, the the sense of unconditional positive regard. Just, you know, is is there such a thing as a bad person in the world? You know, or is it just circumstances that create that? And 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 so everybody has got something in them that is worth that, that is worth a conversation. So yeah, a real sense of open mindedness. I think. Do you think, given the the way the the whole media engine, the social media engine works, do do you think? there's a real headwind or a real danger of um of people not being cognizant of all this rich um experiences that are out there and getting very very narrow and, and blinkered on their on their life oh yeah 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 um, um for, well for me my, my take on it is social media has brought in a completely different perspective which is kind of a an alternative to reality if you like this this sort of imagined virtual space where people can say and do and create and conjure up any kind of truth that people are then prepared to latch onto and, and believe. Um, and it's, and I think that's pretty damaging. You know, there's a lot of advantages for, um, for platforms and social media, etc. But there's also a lot of caution points with it for me. And I think it takes us away, away from true, meaningful conversations with people. You know, you can't just 
click on something and like it and say that I'm now somehow connected to that person. Mm. You have to bond with them. You have to have a conversation with them. And that takes a little bit of time, time that people aren't prepared to invest nowadays. Everything just has to be done straight away. Um, so, yeah, I think, it's, it, I think it, does, it, it does present a bit of a headwind for us. It's interesting. There's a there's, there's a guy, um, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, um, and I know he's he's been heard to say on a number of occasions that you know, the return on investment for life it, are the human interactions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, you you mentioned the word uh, passion, following passion as you as you went through. So you know, sort of making career decisions um, mm-hmm. based on following your passion. What's your what's your thoughts on that about you know um, people should should follow their passion. It's something that I spend a lot of time talking to people about, actually. Um, the, the idea of find something that you're passionate about. Inevitably, that will mean that you'll want to learn about that, you want to practice it, you'll invest in it, and you will inevitably almost start to develop some competence in it, maybe even be an expert in it. Um, so, by that, so by that condition, you've got something that you're passionate about and something that you're actually quite good at. And you'll find outlets for that somewhere in the world there'll be somebody who needs that kind of stuff and you can therefore get a living from it and you start to connect all these things together and suddenly you end up with a really fulfilling life and so it's but it starts with paying attention to what you're really really passionate about and is this do you think where the your um your desire to explore and experience different things do you think that's where that comes from to to sort of you know keep opening doors yeah and life for me is a is a bit of a candy store and i'm a and I'm a kid in it, and <laughs> I, I'm just insanely curious about stuff. Um, it does work against me actually because I'm, I'm I'm no good at anything, but I'm quite good at lots of things. <laughs> so, so I, I I don't I, I don't ever work with something off long enough and stick with it long enough to become a, an absolute world expert in it. But I I just know lots and lots of I know a little bit about lots and lots of different things. Um, and, and, and I just keep wanting to keep turning pages and opening doors and peering behind stuff and see what's going on. Something which you said to me and which really, really stuck with me, and it's, it's a picture I carry with me a lot. Just You, you described to me the fairground. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go yeah. On, t- t- tell me about the fairground. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've always got this, uh, this I, I, I think in metaphors, as you know, but um, I, I've always got this, this, um, this picture in my mind of um, imagine you're at a fairground um and just by saying it now you know you, you're conjuring up the picture in your mind you can see things can't you so um so you can see all the all the roller coasters and ferris wheels and the the side stalls and everything else you know and you're going around this fairground um and it closes at, at the end of the day it's gonna, it's gonna close at 7 p.m and you get to, you get one day in the fairground so you get to decide what you want to do so you, you can wander around you can you can find a ride that you like and you can go in it a few times and you can kind of go, oh, that one looks a little bit risky. I'm not going to go on that one. Um, that No, I don't like that one. I'm not going to go there. And you can just dabble a little bit here and there. But you come away at 7 p.m. and the fairground closes. That's life. That, that's how life works. So if you're going to be in the fairground and it's going to close at 7 p.m., you might as well have a go on a few other things while you're here and make sure that you have a good time. Because when you're saying it closes at seven pm, it's not and it opens tomorrow. No, it's that's it's it. Closing. It's, it's closing. You get one PM. day. Yeah, <laughs> and that's it. You know, yeah. and and I know you know this. People talk about you know the four thousand weeks and that kind of thing. You know, which is quite quite stark when you think of it in those terms. You know, I, I, I say to to quite a few folks that I work with, if you get four thousand weeks, why would you waste any one of them? Yeah, you know, and, and people will, will say to you on a Monday or a Tuesday, oh, soon be Friday. Can't wait till the end of the week. What you get four thousand of these and you're wishing one of them away? Yeah. Why would you do that? <laughs> yeah. How about today? How about today? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly that. No? Exactly. It's brilliant. Uh, so talking of experience in different things, um, I know you've got uh, an interest in uh, space as well. So tell us a bit about. Yeah, that. it's it, it's probably where I get some of my thirst for exploration from actually, because it kind of it just became a, 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 a passion of mine and an obsession from a very early age. I'm so old that I can remember the moon, the moon landing. I can remember the moonshot, um, and I remember. I don't know whether it was live or not, but I have a memory of watching it on a black and white TV, and it would have been 1969, so I would have been four years old, um, and I saw this moon landing. And after that, shortly after that, when I was in my my early years as a as a kid, 
Um, I made a model of the Apollo 11 and all that kind of stuff and just got fascinated with space, this idea of space. And it was it was not so much the the moonshot, um, but it was Apollo 8, I think it was, that was the real hair raiser for me, which was this idea of, because it, it, was, it was an incremental development program, if you like. Nobody knew how to get to the moon, so they had to learn it in steps. And Apollo 8 was the first one that, that launched astronauts to the moon, but didn't land on the moon. They went around the other side to develop the slingshot manoeuvre to get you back to Earth again. So, and, and for that period of time, I think it's 45 minutes, they lose radio contact and these, you, you've, you've lost sight of, of Earth. First time humans have ever done that. And I thought, that's a gutsy move. You know, and, that's, and, and things like that, you, you just go, it's incredible, you know. And, and even today, I look up at, um, at the moon at, at night, if it's a full moon, and look up at the moon and go, there's people stood on that. You know, and it's just, it's just, I just find it incredible that people would do that. So this idea of exploring and going to places that are unknown, even you know, down on on, uh, on planet Earth, um, it still applies. You know, this concept of we've never gone there before, we've never done this before. Let's try this. Let's do that. Let's explore. Let's let's learn and understand. Um, and and I, I just love the the all of the stuff that comes with all of the the moon program. You know, we we came here to. To, to discover the moon, but actually we discovered the earth and all that kind of, you know, love that, that, that sort of mindset of, it, it, it kind of takes me back to, um, it's the T.S. Eliot quote, isn't it, of um, we must not cease from exploration and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we began and to know the place for the first time. And I think, yeah, bang on. Brilliant. Bang on. You yeah. know, I'm going to, I, I want to go out and explore, find new things about myself, new things about other people, but I'm always going to come home. Yeah, that's brilliant, isn't it? Open, open every door, look through every window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. So, um, so that's that that space. Um, what other stuff? What other hobbies? What, what do you? Because obviously, busy doing spinning the four plates, which you explained to start with. But I know you you you've got some other stuff. I, I've, I've got you too. <laughs> I've got yeah. To to my earlier point, actually, about you know, I, I dabble in loads and loads of stuff. I like flying kites. I like photography. You know, I'm not experts in these things, but I've got a few kites. I've got some cameras, and I do, you know. So I, I, I open the box and, and have a go at stuff. Um, I do model making. Um, love, love making models. It's kind of the kid in me that's still still latched on to, to uh, to that um, that way of doing things. So I still like to 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 make models and stuff. Um, I, I got into bread making um, big time. Love the idea of that. Um, found found the process of bread making. I was at it yesterday, actually. I found the process of bread making just miraculous. That you can just take such simple things and create something that is just incredible. You know, it just seems to be two plus two equals like twenty, not not even five. You know, so um, so yeah, love uh, love things like that. Um, passionate uh, motoring uh, motorsport fan, passionate rugby fan. Um, Thing that gets me into into rugby is the is the values of it. I, I love the code of conduct that comes with rugby, um, and the respect that everybody has for each other and for the refereeing staff and so on and so forth. So I think I think um, yeah, loads of stuff, loads of stuff that I'm uh, that I'm into. There's a there's a, a, a lovely thing again that you. Um... Uh, you explained to me and I and I took you up on it and uh, and, and this is relating to the the flying of kites um, and I think this is um, uh, so actually uh, to anyone out there if you've if you've flown a kite great or if you haven't got a kite you need to go get a kite because this is brilliant oh is now, this laying down you said to me <laughs> when you next flying your kite lay down yeah yeah boom Exactly. It's amazing, yeah. um, and I, I can't even put it into words. But when you're flying the kite and you're usually, you know, you kind of cracked up like that, to suddenly lay down, yeah, you feel. I think you described connected. Yeah, feel connected to the ground, and and you've got a sense of I'm I'm playing with the elements here, you know. So suddenly you you're absolutely immersed in what what's going on on the surface of planet Earth, and it's a really it's almost a spiritual experience in some respects. They find it, they find it really, really calming. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that that's one thing, you know, on, on the subject of sort of different experiences today, I, I think I'd strongly <laughs> recommend go go buy a kite if you haven't already got one and, and just have a go. Yeah. 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 But so, if you get your coat wet doing it, don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
what's next? What what? So there's there's lots of things you're you're trying. You want to experience. What else is on your want to experience list? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's whatever's around the next corner. You know. Um, I I don't um, I don't particularly have um, have unfulfilled things that I'm kind of leaning towards. Um, there's a lot of places I want to see that I've not seen. Mm-hmm. Um, but having said that, I'm very mindful that I don't, just don't want to be a carbon emitting tourist and just go places for the sake of it. Um, so it would be nice to do something engaging and meaningful in places that you can also go and enjoy and, and experience, you know. Um, so so rather than just be the, the, the standard sort of tourist, I'd like to do a little bit of that. Um, I've, I've always said I want to learn another language. I think... Um, Whenever I go anywhere, that's what's one of the, my, my sort of standard conditions, if you like, is before I go anywhere, I, I will, well, I do two things, actually. One is, from a language point of view, I will learn how to say yes, no, please, thank you, mm-hmm. in any, in the language of wherever I'm going. I just think it's respectful. And so I, so I do that anyway. Um, the other thing that I do when I go somewhere is I'll, I do a little bit of research into what is the, if you like, the, the peasant food the 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 that is um that is popular in that area what's the sort of go-to dish that that anybody it would eat in in their humblest terms and um because i always find that's the tastiest food actually yeah um and it applies here you know lancashire hot pot etc you know you name it it's um it's fabulous food so i do that as well so uh, so yeah travel i think and and how do you think Though that that desire to experience different things, how, how do you think that links into and plays out in your um, your cause, the, the the your sort of your professional journey? How, how does that manifest itself and appear? Do you think this this desire to want to try different things? It it, it leads to a, a level of innovation, um, and it, it's amazing actually when you come away from uh, large corporate life and into smaller business life, how quickly you can develop and innovate something i'm always kind of quite a creative person i think i'm always thinking about new stuff and um and and that that helps me to just innovate and be curious about that and try and match things that we can do to organizations that could benefit from that so so there's a little bit of that goes on there's just an intense curiosity about that it also means that um i mean my uh, I, th- I think it was my father-in-law actually who said it he, he said i collect idiots <laughs> and, and I'm not suggesting for a minute that I'm I'm doing that, but um, but it's 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 wonderful I think to be able to surround yourself with people with similar outlooks but completely different perspectives on things as well, um, and to just to get different viewpoints from people who who really want to make a difference in the world, you know, find those people, um, and and I think in in thinking it better, we're now starting to develop quite a nice community of people who. Have all got the same overriding ambition, but I've got lots and lots of different perspectives and values to bring to it. Um, so, so I'd continue to do that. Continue to find people who are really great people that we can we can start to use in the companies. Uh, it's something that I think serves us pretty well. So, uh, last question: If you could write yourself a note, and you know, once we've cracked traveling in time, we can we can actually do this. But you you can write yourself a note and put it in an envelope. Um, and your twenty-year-old self will discover this note. What would you write in that note? Do you think today? Um, the immediate phrase that springs to mind for me is, "Don't worry, it's going to be fantastic." <laughs> <laughs> and so far, it has been <laughs> brilliant. Uh, Mel, thanks ever so much. For I mean, I know we chat loads, but for taking the time today for us to have this conversation. No problem at all. Brilliant. Great pleasure. So this has been One Thought at a Time with Ian Travers. Uh, If you want to find out any more about what we've spoken about or explore some of our other really, really interesting conversations, uh, you'll find the link to the show socials um, in the comments section. Uh, uh, And we look forward to, um, to hearing from you and seeing you next time.